Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our very first horse talk. My name is Chris Kaman. I am the founder and president of Chasing Horses Wild Horse Advocates. Our organization advocates for the wild horses that call Theodore Roosevelt National Park home. I want to give a special thank you to Allison from Oregon Wild Horse Organization. Um, she's here to just kind of help and uh, moderate if there's any problems. So I just want to give a quick overview. On December 12, 2022, Theodore Roosevelt National Park announced their plans to eliminate the entire herd of horses from the park. From day one, Chasing Horses Wild Horse Advocates has been leading the fight to save this iconic group of wild horses and keep them in the park. Support for the horses keeps growing, but they are not safe yet. And that seems to be a really big misconception. So we started these horse talks to help educate people and just kind of keep the horses in the forefront. Um, you can learn more about us on our website at www.chwha.org. We're very excited about our first guest today, Dr. Castle McLaughlin. I've had the extreme pleasure of talking to Dr. McLaughlin a lot over this past year. She has so much knowledge to share and it's just, it's just awesome to talk to her all the time. We're also very happy that she's advocating for the horses in the park with us. Dr. Castle McLaughlin retired recently as curator of Harvard's Peabody Museum, where she collaborated with Native people on cultural heritage collections. She is a lifelong horsewoman. Castle worked with Frank and Leo Kuntz and co-founded the Nakota Horse Conservancy, where she served as vice president for many years. Castle, Castle worked for the National Park Service as an interpretive ranger at the Knife River Indian Villages and at Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. She was commissioned to research the history of the wild horses in Theodore Roosevelt National Park. The result of her three years of research brought us the history and status of the wild horses of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. This report has been referenced countless times over the last year as all of us created our comment letters to the park. A fun fact that I learned about Castle recently is that she's a pretty incredible artist. She actually studied art before she ended up on the path that life took her on. We have everyone muted because there were just under 100 people who signed up for this event. If you have questions during the presentation for Castle, we ask that you enter them in the chat and we'll read as many questions as possible after Dr. McLaughlin's presentation. Thank you again for joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce someone I consider a dear friend, Dr. Castle McLaughlin. Hey, thank you, Chris. And thank you, Allison, for being here to help facilitate this. Welcome to everybody who's joined us. I am going to give about a 30 minute presentation about the history of the horses in the park, because that's such an important issue for understanding the situation. And because debates over their future are turning on something of a dialectic or conflict between the concept of history and natural resource management. So I'm gonna stop my video, but um, it, take you through some slides about the history, and then uh, I'll rejoin, hopefully. We're having some technological issues and have a more conversational um, session. So um, let's see, all right. So to orient people, um, Theodore Roosevelt National Park encompasses about 70,000 acres of the Little Missouri Badlands in far southwestern North Dakota. So not far from the Montana and South Dakota borders. Um, until the 19th century, about the middle of the 19th century, this was a really important hunting zone for regional tribes, especially Lakotas, especially Sitting Bull's Hunk Papa Band and his allies. This was said to be one of his favorite regions. Um, and also Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara. So when treaties came along and began to define formal tribal boundaries, this area was sort of at the juncture between Lakota and Hidatsa Mandan territory. But of course, after the Civil War, the federal government reduced those tribal lands dramatically in a succession of acts, um, mainly to facilitate uh, Euro-American settlement. Uh, this is the period when everyone was moving west uh, on various trails, most famously the Bozeman Trail, and also to facilitate building of the transcontinental railroad. So this is one of the areas of the west. Uh, millions of bison were intentionally slaughtered 
to help force tribes to settle on reservations. And that led, of course, to conflict. There were a couple battles between Lakota and U.S. military in this area um, over those conflicts. And the trail that Custer and the 7th Cavalry took from what's the, now the area of Bismarck Mandan to the Little Bighorn uh, battle goes right through here. So documentation of wild horses in this area, the Little Missouri Badlands, goes back to the middle of the uh, 19th century. And it's ideal country for them because before the advent of helicopters, it was really difficult to capture them you know, by riding and roping. So this is a schematic of the south unit of the park. There are three main units. There's a north unit and a south unit that are about 50 miles apart, joined by the Little Missouri River. And then there's a small historic uh, site in between them, which is the preserves the headquarters of Theodore Roosevelt's um, ranch. So the South unit is about 46,000 acres of the total 70,000. And as I said, this is where the horses are. There are none in the North unit. They don't tend to occupy the entire park. They pretty much stick to the south and southeast portion. So along Highway 94 at the bottom of the slide and then around to the right underneath that scenic loop drive um, is pretty much their territory. And they share the park with many other species, but most notably bison and elk pronghorn and bighorn sheep. Um, those are all sort of charismatic megafauna in park service culture. And they were all extirpated from the area and then reintroduced in the middle of the 20th century when the park was created. So was created as a national memorial park in 1947 and didn't get full national park status till 1978. And those are kind of important because those designations drive management to some extent. And before we go on to the next slide, I just want to uh, do note that the park is adjacent to this little town of Medora down on the lower left. And, and you can see the Chateau, Chateau de Moore State Historic Site, which I'm gonna mention in a minute as well. So the park is so named because Theodore Roosevelt did ranch there as a young man. He first came to North Dakota in 19 or Dakota Territory in 1883 to hunt some of those few last bison. And he decided to stay and invest in cattle ranching. Um, so um he only was there for three or four years and not even full time, but he felt it was really a transformative experience. And he famously said that he would not have been president if not for his experiences there. He wrote uh, three books about his experiences in the Badlands, including the following passage, which I have truncated to shorten. Quote, in a great many, indeed in most localities, there are wild horses to be found, which although invariably of domestic descent, being either themselves runaways from some ranch or Indian outfit, or else claiming such for their sires and dams, are yet as quite as wild as the antelope on whose domain they have intruded. I quote that because the discovery of Roosevelt's references to wild horses in his writings about the Badlands were key to their protection by the National Park Service, even though that has always been rather tepid. But Roosevelt's experiences in, the, in Dakota also um, inspired his awareness of the need for conservation. And I think and of course, once he became president, he used his authority to set aside hundreds of millions of acres, started the National Forest Service, he created five national parks and lots of wildlife refuges. Refuges, And he's rightly remembered or considered our conservation president. Um, he decided to stay in North Dakota because he wanted to participate 
in the open range ranching boom of the 1880s. So after bison were exterminated, it provided an opportunity for big cattle companies out of Texas to expand onto the northern, up into the northern plains. And uh, if you remember the movie Lonesome Dove, it was basically about that happening. So this is truly the heyday of the cowboy because there were no fences. Um, it only lasted about 20 years, but I think we all know that the mythology of that era has proven incredibly powerful and persistent in American culture. And in fact, most tourism in North Dakota is driven by sites that are associated with frontier ranching or Native American and military history, including two other national park sites, the Lewis and Clark Historic Trail, Fort Abraham Lincoln, where the 7th Cavalry was posted, and also contemporary Native uh, and Western or cowboy cultures. But the park is the top tourism uh, destination in North Dakota, and they had some 800,000 visitors in 2021. And that town of Medora um, works to maintain kind of a frontier character and is also home to the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. And every summer they have a musical review that celebrates the Old West. Another of Roosevelt's contemporaries was the Marquis de Moore. Um, he was a French entrepreneur and cavalry officer who married the daughter of a New York banker, and they moved to the Dakotas to also get into the cattle business. Demours is the person who founded the town of Medora, which he named after his wife. And in 1883, he purchased 250 horses that had been confiscated from Sitting Bull and other Lakota bands who had surrendered at Fort Buford, North Dakota. And this is another government policy to um, dismount and disarm native people to force them onto reservations. But that is remembered um, with a lot of bitterness by uh, native people who value horses so highly. And most of the horses that were taken from them basically just disappeared. So it was unusual for Demore to do this. Um, but he came to, he praised the athleticism and stamina of the horses he purchased. And he used them on his ranch and he planned to raise them on a larger scale on the open range. So this photograph shows Demore and his wife. She is mounted on a little stout roan horse, which I'm sure is one of the horses he got through that purchase. And again, their he only lasted a few years. Um, but their house or chateau is a historic site in Medora. Just the year after he bought those horses, he sold 60 of the mares to the HT Ranch and Little Missouri uh, Horse Company near Amadon, so not far away. That was at one time probably the largest horse ranch in the United States. They had like 4,000 head at one point, all on the open range. So they they employed a lot of hands to manage that many horses but they bred those Lakota mares to thoroughbred and Percheron stallions and they marketed the offspring as ranch horses and polo ponies they too were out of business by the early 20th century with mechanization and so forth but in the 1930s historian Frank Doby who was from Texas and wrote a number of books about wild horse history he visited the area and local people told him that they were still very uh, aware of the legacy of these Lakota horses and that many of the local riding horses and also uh, the local wild bands had been influenced by those horses. And based on the appearance of the horses that I saw in the 1980s compared with photographs, I think there's a really strong um, probability that those horses did impact the wild bands in the area. The rest of the story pretty much parallels wild horse history across the whole country. So, um, you know, lands are privatized and fenced into family farms and ranches. Um, wild horses are increasingly seen as undesirable. 
and especially as unwelcome competition for uh, commercial livestock. Some people in the area viewed them as economic resources and they would make money catching and selling them. Sometimes groups of people would do this, sometimes individuals, especially when prices were relatively high, like during World War I. This is the earliest photograph I was able to find of a wild horse roundup in Western North Dakota. It was taken in the 1930s, and that was the turning point decade for wild horses across the United States because in response to the drought and depression, the federal government created a whole bureaucracy dedicated to the rational management of public lands and created the BLM and so forth. So in the 1930s and 40s, both state and federal agencies um, rounded up horses throughout Western North Dakota and, and sold them to who knows who. Um, but they cleaned most of them up as they, they put it. So the only reason that there are wild horses in Theodore Roosevelt National Park is because when it was fenced around 1950, they accidentally trapped two different bands of wild horses um, into the park. And at the time, local ranchers were still grazing their horses in the park. So uh, in 1954, the Park Service sponsored a two-day roundup to remove um, the horses. And this is a photograph from that event. They did get about 80% of the horses and virtually every horse that they caught was branded and claimed. According to people I interviewed that participated in it, they got few, if any, of the horses that the locals considered to be truly wild. So sadly, um, for the next 20 years, the Park Service tried everything they could think of to kill um, and or remove the horses that remained in the park. And the reason they did that is, you know, because the Park Service has a strong mission of prioritizing what they consider to be um, na native environments and species and a strong bias against exotics. Um, and that is how they view the horses. For the most part, they're not subject to any of the federal uh, laws that protect wild equines on public lands in the U.S. They went to court twice to ensure that they were exempt from all those laws. But at the same time, the park was established as a memorial to Theodore Roosevelt, and for the first 25 years, the emphasis was on regional history. Um, and that and that open range era. And so a couple of superintendents felt that the horses would be a good living history display to help interpret that era. And they became um, designated as what the Park Service has called a historic demonstration herd. Um, and that also applies to the few longhorns up in the North unit. At the same time, the park was always very careful to refer to them only as feral, never wild. Um, they did virtually no research. They um, did virtually no interpretation of them for many years, but they tolerated them. So I came into the picture as a young and naive um, graduate student who got um, a seasonal job at Knife River Indian Villages in Stanton, North Dakota, which ended up turning into like a four-year stint with the Park Service. Um, I got this job late in the summer because someone quit. And at the time, I had had horses all my life and had been a really active rider. The Park Service had very few people that could ride at all. So within two weeks of my arriving in North Dakota, they sent me to Theodore Roosevelt Park to, to ride in a roundup of the horses there. And at the time, the target uh, population for horses in the park was about 40, which was arbitrarily set. Um, and the Park Service was rounding up both bison and horses about every five years or so to keep, you know, to cull the herd and 
and keep the population down. Um, by this time, they're using a combination of helicopters and riders. And this particular roundup removed about half the horses from the park, uh, leaving around 62 head that were segregated into five different stallion bands and then a bachelor band. It was a really transformative experience for me, but not pleasant. I ended up not riding, which I was soon very grateful for because it was a uh, it was really actually a traumatic experience. It was very violent, even brutal. Um, I saw a lot of horses injured and several horses killed. Um, and of course, I was curious, why was this happening? Where did these horses come from? You know, what's the big plan? And when I asked park managers those questions, they couldn't really answer because they had never bothered to do any research. And so eventually they invited me to submit a proposal to do research and it was funded by the Theodore Roosevelt Nature and History Association. So I do wanna point out quickly just a couple of the people in this image, which are important characters in the story, but we don't have time to talk about. The man in the plaid shirt standing down by the uh, corral is Tom Tesher, who is a very well-respected local rancher and former saddle bronc champion who was personally interested in the horses and kept records for many years about the different bands and, and um, the offspring every year. And, and also he basically managed the horses for the park service for quite a while. And Tom was assigned to be one of my research advisors. And then Leo Kuntz is standing on the fence at the far right in the white t-shirt. Of course, he went on to take horses from the park and create what's now known as the Nakoda horses. And his younger brother, Joe, is on this um, dark bay or brown horse in the foreground with the hat. So at the time, um, after the roundups, the Park Service would sell the quote unquote surplus horses at livestock auctions, mainly to slaughter buyers. Um, so I went to the sale about a week after the roundup and I bought this dominant stallion um, who's looking at us here. He's actually the horse that was in the slide, previous slide as well. Um, Fortunately, I also met Frank and Leo at that sale um, after I had purchased this horse. And so he went home with them because that was the first sale that, uh, again, that Leo began buying horses to save them from slaughter because he felt they were special. And, you know, at the time he wanted to use them for these cross country races because their stamina and agility. Um, but the bigger picture was that this, as I learned, this particular roundup was part of an initiative um, in which the Park Service was attempting to remove as many dominant stallions as possible and replace them with domestic breeds, uh, especially quarter horses, but there was an Arabian and also BLM horses. Um, I was very opposed to that as were many other people, because I felt like the horses that had been there for a hundred years and had adapted so well to that environment were not only historically significant, but deserved to be the horses there and deserved to be the horses that visitors saw. Uh, but that fell on deaf ears and the park continued that for at least another 10 years. So later, um, Leo, and still later, the Nakota Horse Conservancy purchased as many of those horses as possible to, to save them. But roundups were always controversial, and often bad things happen. And around the mid 2000 teens, the Park Service began moving to soft capture methods, um, including darting horses with tranquilizers, and selling them over the internet instead of at sale barns like this. Um, and then to curb the population, they also started working with Colorado State University 
on the immunocontraceptive gonicon, administering that to park mares to decrease their fertility. And that worked as what that worked, but that's also not without controversy. So where are we now and why has the park finally decided to just get rid of the horses after 70 years? Um, I'm told that there are about 185 head in the park right now. This is an image that Chris took and is allowing me to use. That's a really large band of horses. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no research that shows that horses uh, are damaging the environment or overgrazing any more than elk and some other species. But um, Montana State University did estimate the carrying capacity of horses in the park at between 50 and 90 head. Of course, that's all relative, but that is a problem because geneticists have estimated that 150 head are necessary to maintain genetic diversity. And that is low in this population. But I would say the park service in general have never been enthusiastic stewards of the horses. They've never developed a dedicated management plan for the horses. They've been ambivalent. They, the policy has been erratic, sometimes changing from one superintendent to the next. At times, they've framed them as livestock, feral horses, or wildlife. Um, only a few times of any documents or Park Service employees referred to them as wild, and that wasn't until the 1990s when they began to interpret them a little bit. So one of the reasons the park points to is that these horses require intensive management, which means they're expensive, um, and their management is always controversial, which is another cost to the park service. And even when I was there in the 1980s, it was primarily just local people that would know what was happening with the horses and would protest actions the park took or when they you know, threatened to get rid of them. Um, but now with increased visitation to the park and especially the advent of the internet, there are thousands of people across the country that follow the horses through people like Chris and others who are out in the park a lot and photograph the different bands. And so people come to know the horses as individuals and families, and they watch the interactions between the groups. So actually the park service is under more scrutiny and uh, with regard to the horses than ever. Another thing the park serve superintendent has stated is that the, there's a need for them to increase their focus on bison. So if they remove the horses, it will provide additional forage um, to compensate for the looming threat of climate change and so forth. Now, currently there are bison in both the North and South units. In the South unit, their carrying capacity is two to 500, and I think they're already at that upper threshold, but they do want more. And bison have always been probably, you know, the most preferred species for the National Park Service. They're even incorporated into the logo. Um, so this isn't coming from the superintendent at Theodore Roosevelt. I think it reflects a larger, broader um, federal interest in restoring plains grasslands and bison, which is a commendable thing. And in 2020, the Department of Interior announced a 10-year bison conservation initiative, which they've been engaging in, in partnership with tribes and states. That's a really um, advance for the Park Service because they've always been very insular with regard to their policies and decision. Now they're reaching out to create these larger consortiums um, and pool expertise, including indigenous knowledge to help with bison restoration. So that's a good thing. And just earlier this month, the department announced that um, money from the Inflation Reduction Act, they had been funded um, to, uh, or they are funding a new initiative that they're calling the Restoration and Resilience Framework, through which they help to 
they hope to address climate change, um, restore environments across the plains, and enhance community well-being. And bison restoration is one is probably the keystone initiative in that. So um, there are much larger issues coming into play here than just the superintendents uh, at the park. But the local superintendent has also stated that they're no longer interested in the legacy of Theodore Roosevelt as a rancher, that going forward, they're just gonna concentrate on his conservation legacy. And of course, by extension, um, this is signaling that there's gonna be less attention to regional history um, and especially to the open range ranch era. And this is why they've recently reclassified the horses as livestock to help facilitate their removal because they're, they're recalibrating their commitment to natural resource management and they're dropping their, his not all of course, but some of their historic interests and interpretation. But this has also put them in conflict with the state of North Dakota and with the local community because Medora is right in the heart of ranching country and it's all about their Old West heritage. North Dakota has traditionally been a very agriculturally dependent state, but tourism is increasingly important and publicity campaigns in the last 15 years um, have expressly focused on Theodore Roosevelt, Demore, Sitting Bull, and the horses. And the horses, or the park is often cited um, on websites as being the best place in the United States for visitors to see wild horses. So a lot of people come expressly for that purpose. And this has not escaped the notice of the North Dakota tourism officials. Um, and they've come to view them as one of the state's unique attractions that they don't want to lose. So for the first time, the state's really gone to bat for the horses. And in late January, the governor and other state leaders held a press conference at which they announced their opposition to the park plans. Um, the governor released a letter that he had written to the park superintendent stating that, quote, removing the horses or reducing the herd size to a level that fails to support genetic diversity or longevity would strike a blow to park visitation and the economic vitality of the entire state. And the governor's also offered to work collaboratively with the park service um, by supporting research that would find a way to keep them in the park. He and other state officials have also been in direct contact with the director of the park service and um, congressional committee members, et cetera. Um, also, the five major tribes of North Dakota issued a joint statement opposing the park's plan to remove the horses. And thanks to people like Chris, thousands of people have found out about the situation and have been expressing their support for the horses by commenting um, on the park's plans, writing editorials to newspapers, writing to North Dakota state officials, and so forth. And most recently, just last week, the state legislature unanimously passed a concurrent resolution calling on the park to keep the horses because, quote, the horses of Theodore Roosevelt National Park are historically and culturally significant to the state of North Dakota and the history of the United States and serve as a living legacy to President Roosevelt. So, State leaders are rallying quite strongly behind the horses, but the fact is that they don't have any legal recourse. And whether they or the thousands of citizens that have expressed support for the horses will have any impact on the Park Service is really a big question. I think their future very much hangs in the balance because the NPS holds all the cards. Um, so what can you do if you're interested in following this situation? Chris has established a great website where she's constantly posting updates about what's happening and ideas about what people can do. She's also started a nonprofit. So um, 
to help her with her advocacy. And so please do check out her website to follow. And if you're able to volunteer for Chris or donate to her nonprofit, because she's really been working tirelessly and she's proven incredibly effective at getting us where we are now. Um, so that includes my prepared remarks. I hope now we can um, take some questions and have more of a conversation. Thank you, Castle. We appreciate your, your presentation. That was really awesome. Um, we do have a question maybe you can answer is why are bison being used as a help for climate change? Aren't bison nearly as bad as cattle for climate change? I really, whoops, I I don't think they're saying that they're helping climate change, uh, but, but, you know, bison are critical to the restoration of native plains grasslands. They co-evolved with the native plains grasslands. And so to reestablish those environments in a healthy way, they need to also include some of the keystone species and, and bison are the most preferred preferred of of all okay um someone asked too will the north dakota government buy all the horses if they're removed uh, we don't have any reason to believe that i think right now the governor and other state legislators are hoping that they stay in the park especially medora is going to go through a huge transformation over the next few years as they get ready for the uh theater roosevelt presidential library so um everyone's really just hoping that they stay in the park so why are the horses so expensive for the mps to maintain i think that in castle maybe you can talk about this it has to do with the way that they're they're maintaining the herd um i think it's day to day they're not doing anything for the horses the horses are surviving on their own it's when they're capturing horses and taking them out and that's just a management issue when they remove horses, even the soft captures that they're doing, we can tell you there are at least 10 to 20 different people who are there. Um, a vet, they have shooters who are darting the horses and just different different people who are there to play their different part in the captures. And it's very expensive. This is something where, and we've argued for this for a long time, responsible birth control um, could really help that. And it's been proven in so many other herds, especially Assateague Island, which is another national park. So I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but I think that it has to do with the ways that they're capturing horses. And I'm sure helicopters and outriders was extremely expensive back in the day also. Yes, that's right. And I think um, more to the point probably is that the park would prefer to use those resources for management of bison and elk and and other initiatives that are higher considered higher priority. But it's also just a preference because they're doing it in acetate and they're doing it with a lot of success. It's absolutely just a preference. Even the carrying capacities are set relative to other species. So I don't know if people are probably some of the people um, with us this afternoon aren't very uh, aware of what goes on at Theodore Roosevelt, but you know, they've also had a problem with elk over overpopulation, um, which led to them having to authorize hunts, which is really unusual for the park service. So it's 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 how they prioritize the species that they and the lands that they that they steward. And the fact is that they value bison, elk, uh, bighorn, and other species. Um, much more than they do horses. When you say the National Park Service isn't interested in interpretation, what does that mean? Well, that means that for many years, I mean, if you went to, if you were a visitor to the park, you wouldn't find literature on the horses. You wouldn't find brochures on the horses. Um, rangers wouldn't mention the horses, or if they did, it would just be a cursory mention. And I think partly that the Park Service's um, attitude was just let's not call a lot of attention to these horses because they were ambivalent about their presence and they were willing to tolerate them as a historic demonstration herd, but they didn't want to invest in them and um, transform them into animals that were seen as 
integral parts of the story there. So they just kind of said as little about them as they could. And that really not into the 1990s did they start um, making some things available. Right, someone's and saying that they're still not mentioning them on the internet. They don't mention them either. Um, we have a shop also in Medora and people come in constantly and tell us, you know, I went into the park and asked about the horses and they don't really have much to say. There's, there's not, I mean, again, it still is that um, there's not a lot of, not, not, not a lot of knowledge that, that there are horses in the park. If you didn't know and you walked in, you'd know there were bison, you would know there were elk prairie dogs, of course, but you would not have an idea that there were. The park has to develop a wild horse management plan that takes into consideration the health and viability of the horses and that will cost money and require expert personnel. That's actually, in my opinion, and you could probably speak longer to this too, Castle, that's their job. Um, they, they went to court, like Castle said, they asked to not be included in the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. So they're charged with the management of these horses. Um, they were supposed to be managing them all along and we've been arguing and fighting for a management plan because the last one was done in 1978 and it's very outdated and it's um, very controversial in itself too. So, um, I and again, I think they're doing it at Assateague that's being done in other places. So the cost, I don't think, I think, I think it's costing them more to do what they're doing now. Yeah, of course, another part of that is they, they don't want to go to the trouble to really learn the, learn the horses. That is um, to differentiate them as individuals and families and so forth. Um, that's, been part of the conflict, I think, because they refuse to recognize them as individuals. They like to talk about populations and we're just managing for sex and age and, and things like that. So that was part of their resistance to managing for a his, historically accurate herd um, is it was too much trouble. It would, um, there wasn't really anyone on staff interested in learning the resident horses well enough to help make those decisions and so forth. Um, they, Tom Tesher was doing that for the park. Like he was basically, I mean, if you want to talk about Tom a little bit, he's a big part of the history. Well, Tom did do that. Um, but I view that as an abrogation of their responsibility also. Right, I agree. So... Mm -hmm. They shouldn't really have local people managing the horse herd for their preferences. It should be, um, in my view, they should be viewed as cultural resources and um, they should invest in learning about them and how to best manage them. But because, and the park needs to recognize how beloved these horses are by visitors. And it's really going to be interesting to see what happens because it raises a lot of questions about park service relationships with their host states and also um, do the voices of citizens and park visitors matter to the park service. So someone asked, are the Lakota tribes going to take the large majority of these horses to save the herd? They have first right, correct? The park has said that they would first, um, the tribes would have first pick at horses, but the tribes have recently come out, like Hassel had mentioned, the United Tribes of North Dakota came out and said, um, we stand behind the governor and the lawmakers in North Dakota. We think the horses should stay in the park. And I believe it was um, one of the chairmen for one of the tribes was actually on TV saying, we don't want the horses, keep them where they are. So that also brings up another question, then what is gonna to happen to 185 horses if the tribes aren't interested? Now we're looking at kill buyers again, which is another fear, because really where are these horses gonna go? When it's when we've got a, a good amount of the horses too that are older, um, the younger ones have always been easy to sell and that's what the park always goes after. But, um, but yeah, so the tribes have already said, we're not interested. So it'll be interesting to see those are things that we don't know. So I think those discussions could still continue if it comes to that. I, I'm not giving up entirely on that, but um, we'll have to see. Uh, that They are obliged to consult with tribes because it was tribal land. 
but again, uh, I don't think they're obliged to to follow the guidance that tribes give them. They do consult about the bison, and they often provide quote unquote surplus bison to the three affiliated tribes, for example, who maintain a pretty big herd. <clears throat> but again, the Park Service has a way of just uh, following their own um, guidance. Um, we've seen many incidents in the past where they've blatantly disregarded input from scientists and tribal people and, and others. So um, has it's a hard to be optimistic. Have, has a conservation group organized um, to save the horses along with Leo Kuntz? Leo Kuntz actually sadly passed away a few years ago. His brother Frank is still alive and Castle worked with them so she can talk to them and the work that they did. Um, they were part of the Nakota Horse Conservancy. They founded that. Um, so these horses are, and maybe you can talk to this better. I mean, this is this is where I think your your horses, we talked about this before, like your horses that you knew in the park were there. And now these are my horses that are here, you know, like the difference. So you can talk to that a little bit, maybe. No, I was going to actually invite you to talk about what you view as the best ways forward or the best case scenario, because I know that that you're a big proponent of national legislation yeah. and also the possibly the idea of a of a sanctuary of some kind. So a couple of things that that we're working on as an organization and that we're hoping to do is one. Um, Cape Lookout National Seashore is another national park that has wild horses, and those horses are protected under public law. So we're hoping that that sets a precedent. I and mean, if we have some horses protected under public law and national park lands, then why aren't ours? So we will be going to Washington, D.C. in April to speak at the Save Our Wild Horses Conference. And we're meeting with as many lawmakers as we can to, um, to talk about that. Another option is yes, to try to get a wild horse sanctuary in southwestern North Dakota. Um, that's a very long term plan. Um, we're, we're just at the beginnings of trying to find someone to do a feasibility study for that. But, um, and that would just take on, take a, um, be a matter of, of land, of, funding and all of that stuff too. So that's something that's on our radar that we're looking at, but it's it's not anything that's going to help this herd right now. So Chris, would you mind speaking to what happens next? Um, so what happens next is, and I think that this is where some of the confusion comes in. The park is right now performing their environmental assessment. That's what they told us. So the comment period was for all of us to let them know what we wanted them to consider. Their, their first option, their choice is complete elimination of the horses. The NEPA process says we have to look at a no action alternative, which goes back to the 1978 plan. And then they have to also consider other reasonable alternatives, which is what the comment period, why the last comment period was so important. So now they should have looked at all the comments. They should have decided um, what alternatives they're gonna consider. And now they're doing an environmental assessment, which will just look at what happens to the park if we take all of the horses out, what happens? What is the impact on the environment of anything? And if there's a significant impact on the environment, they're supposed to do an environmental impact statement. The park seems very hell-bent on doing an environmental assessment, which is just an easier way through this and a quicker way to get rid of the horses, essentially. Um, so, we'll, so we don't know what they're going to do. I mean, we can speculate all we want, I can tell you that we did just talk to a reporter on Friday and the superintendent did respond to her, which was interesting. So um, they said that they're in the process of doing their environmental assessment and they will be back in the spring or summer with the results of that EA. So when the EA comes out, they'll say, this is, these are the alternatives that we consider. And this is, this is what our research found. Um, and then there'll be another public comment period to comment on that. Spring or summer? Spring or summer, correct. So, so, there, so someone's saying too about Allison about if there were no roundups, there wouldn't be so much of an expense. The horses have to be managed. 
And I think that that's the big argument. And I think it's an argument that goes back to probably Castle when you were with Frank and, um, and Leo in starting the Nakota Horse Conservancy. The problem is that they, and Frank says this all the time, we're just asking you to do your job just manage the horses. You allowed them to stay. They became under your, your management. You're supposed to manage them. So do your job. And that's what we're asking. Roundups do get expensive, but the way that they're doing it is expensive. As a Teague Island has been using PZP, they look at genetics, they look at bloodlines, they take all of that into consideration and they haven't had to remove any horses. Um, they haven't had to, they haven't, they aren't even using birth control right now because it's working so well. They also, I've talked to the chief resource manager who is extremely transparent and will talk to you very easily instead of this portal that the park has set up that's, you know, just they answer questions when they want to and however they want to, and they're not transparent. Um, but he has said, we don't want Assateague Island horses at large in the public, which is beautiful, right? You don't want to hear that the Assateague Island horses are going to slaughter. They, they don't want those things happening. So they've managed their herd. There's no reason why if that national park can do that, that this national park can't. There's absolutely no reason. We're talking apples to apples here. We're not talking BLM. We're not talking Anaki horses. We're not talking Salt River. We're talking national park to national park. Yeah. So yeah, and federal legislation does seem, and that's what I, I've talked to a lot of people about too, because people who've lived here for years have said, this is like the second or third time that they have threatened to eliminate the horses. And I don't know if you can speak to that more, Castle. I mean, there were a lot of public outcries in the past and it seems like their notes even through, I know through your um, report that you did, it's almost like a warning for them. Um, like, don't do, don't try to remove all the horses because public outcry is like way too much and they still went ahead with it anyway, so. It's, it, it is shocking that they would go to this extreme. Uh, they're willing ask. to, if they're willing to weather this withering um, tempest of criticism about the removal, that that's going to be surprising to me. Um, has legal action been helpful? We do have a legal team that we're working with, Eubanks and Associates out of Washington, D.C. Um, they've been very helpful to us, and we believe that they've been instrumental in helping us get um, get the park to do their job. So um, there are a number of things that we're talking to our lawyers about and really it all just depends on what the park's next steps are. So there's no legal action to take at this time. Right now we're waiting. So, and while we're waiting, we're trying to keep awareness up. We're trying to get something started so that we can get the horses protected under public law. Um, that's why getting Congressman Armstrong on board is so important because how can I go to any congressional members in other states and say, hey, help our Theodore Roosevelt National Park horses when our own congressman isn't on board with that? So that's why we've been asking people to get him on board. And we're hoping that now that the state of North Dakota has passed the resolution asking for the horses to stay, that he'll change his position since this seems to be the overwhelming opinion of most of the state of North Dakota. So. Um, has Ghanacon sterilized the horses? There are a lot of controversy to that. Um, I think that there'll be some information coming out soon. There was a, an article that we posted on our website um, a few weeks ago that came out, I believe in 2021, talking about how 92% of the mares in the park had been permanently sterilized. But when you ask the park, they say no. So again, that's a problem with transparency and that's a problem with um, a problem that, that, uh, that we're having. Uh, speak about the Shackleford Banks horses. Yeah, the Shackleford Banks wild horses are protected under public law. So we had talked about that a little bit too. Um, public law, it, it's a federal pub public law. They were lucky enough to find a representative in Congress to support what they were doing. And so that just went on. So what we're hoping is that we can say to our congressional delegates, hey, we're protecting these wild horses in Shackleford Banks under public law. What about the Theodore Roosevelt National Park horses? Um, it doesn't seem like one should be without the other. And this is also part of the problem with the National Park Service. And I think that you talked about that a little bit. There's no consistency between parks. So 
Um, our local cattle ranchers supporting removing the horses? No, there's no, this is different than uh, the horses on the Western Range. These horses are fenced into a national park. So cattle ranchers, are there, these horses are no threat to cattle ranchers. And I would think Castle, I think that you talked to a lot of people and most of the ranchers in the area, I think that they were some of the strongest supporters for keeping the horses in the park, right? Yes, that's true. The local ranching community at that time, there were older people alive that had participated in roundups in the early 20th century um, who really felt the horses were the most important thing in the park. They really identified with the horses. Um, they really saw them as, you know, symbols of independence and freedom, as many people do. And they felt that there were strong cultural traditions in the area of, um, you know, chasing the horses, catching the horses. A lot of people had stories about horses that they or their family had caught that turned into, you know, great ranch horses or whatever. Um, so you're right. And when the park tried to get rid of all the horses, they, they did that mainly by hiring local ranchers um, and cowboys to go in and rope and remove them and including Tom. But um, I, you know, I think Tom like missed loops a lot, you know, he didn't want all the, to see the horses all removed. So he would get a contract from the park service to go in and remove them. And he might take a couple out, but you know, he would always say there were some he couldn't get. And at that time, anyway, in the eighties, that was a pretty um, widely shared sentiment among um, the ranching community around Medora. Um, I don't know what the cowboy hall of fame's position is, but Chris, didn't you talk to the, Medora Foundation president and right, the Medora Foundation president is very focused on keeping these horses in the park. So Randy, um, I had talked to him about that. And for people who don't know the Medora Foundation, um, Medora is a very unique little town and the Medora Foundation um, is really been instrumental in keeping the town alive. I don't know how else to say it. Um, they have a lot of shops, they have the musical, they have they have a lot of input and influence in the state of North Dakota and in Medora. So that's a very big thing. And that's something too that um, we're hoping the park, the park should be taking into consideration. Um, so somebody asked, uh, MHA Nation understands pr the pragmatic range management. They could provide guidance to the NPS. They absolutely could. There are a lot of people that could provide guidance. Um, if the if the park wanted to have that, and Governor Burgum actually offered any of the resources we have in the state of North Dakota. So, um, and I, and I mean that is from financial to people to our universities, whatever they need. If they need science, he said we'll give them science. We we have that. So um, it's up to the park on what they're going to do. And the governor, I was at a coffee with the legislators yesterday, and our House Majority Leader Mike Lafour was there, and. One of our local senators, Dean Rummel, was there. And Mike LaFour had said, I, I had brought to his attention the National Park Traveler article that I, I know Castle, you and I had talked about that too. Um, and I told them, I was actually talking with our lawyers about that the day before the coffee with the legislators. And they felt that the superintendent's tone in how she was answering things seems like they're staying the course and going to keep eliminating, go on with their to eliminate the horses. And Mike LaFour had said that he believed that in the conversation that they had with the National Park Service Director Sams and the superintendent and North Dakota legislators, Senator Kramer, Senator Hova, and our attorney general, that um, the federal director of the National Park Service seemed very interested in working with the state of North Dakota to keep the horses. And he seemed very open to what was happening. He didn't get the same feeling from our superintendent. So we're not, so again, that's gonna be something to see how it played out. He told me he personally would call Senator Hoven and see where things were at with him on this and continue to talk to Senator Hoven every month until a decision is reached to stay on top mm -hmm. of the, these horses stay. Uh, Senator Rummel also told me that the governor personally asks him about this quite often and just asked him about it um, earlier last week. So he was gonna share the National Park Traveler 
article with him and um, give him kind of an update from the coffee with the legislators. So that was another, that's been a, it, that's a local thing that our, our um, chamber of commerce does. And it's been really great. And it's, it came at a very good time with all of this happening with the horses. So um, it gave us access to the horses uh, and that recording we will be sharing as soon as it's available so that you guys can see exactly what Mike LaFour said. There was a lot of good information shared. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that or no. No, um, you're the one with the finger on the pulse of the state <laughs> and local um, battlefield, so to speak. Um, could I talk about how easy it was to get appointments with legislators and how important it is to make your voice heard that way? So that's from Heather from the Save Our Wild Horses Conference. Um, and really thank you to Heather and Linda for putting that on. I, I, in my last life, I worked at an exhibit company. So we were on the backside of doing trade shows. So I know that's what a huge undertaking this is that these two are doing and I give them a lot of credit. So for those of you who don't know, April 23rd to 25th is the second annual Save Our Wild Horses Conference. And part of what Heather and Linda have been asking people to do is during that time to set up appointments with your legislators and talk about wild horses. And it's a great time to do that and for everyone to do that. Um, how easy is it? You can go to their web, to the website, the different websites for your own legislators and ask, um, request an appointment. You can send emails, you can call. I think that we've gotten about four or five appointments set up and I'm gonna spend this week following up on some other ones. So even if you can't, go to Washington DC in person, you can set up a phone conversation with your local legislators and just let them know um, the wild horses in the United States matter to you. It doesn't have to necessarily be Theodore Roosevelt National Park. It could be your own herd or wild horses everywhere. Um, but it's a, it's a good way to do that. They also have a postcard campaign and we have information on both our website and they have it on theirs about just flooding the Capitol with postcards and, and letting our legislators know, hey, we need to pay attention to the wild horses. What's happening is not right. Um, see what else we have? How is the BLM involved with the National Park Service? Um, the BLM and the National Park Service fall under the jurisdiction of the Department of the Interior. They do have some uh, overlap in their relationships. For example, um, we know that the BLM has funded a lot of the Ghanacon research that's gone on in the National Park Service. We know that the experimentation on Ghanacon and the horses also. Um, was reported back to the BLM and those are things that they're using now on the Western range. So even though they're two separate entities, they fall under the same jurisdiction of the Department of the Interior and um, they can work together if they needed to. So um, I don't know if that answers that. The BLM does not have any jurisdiction over the National Park Service horses, so. Yes, and there was the famous occasion where a BLM range specialist was hired to come assessed the herd at Theodore Roosevelt and spent three days, wrote a report and they just, you know, put it in the back of the file cabinet and it was never um, referenced again. So. Yeah, it was, it's put with the 1978 EA and it's sad because he pretty much debunked everything they said in the 1978 EA. And like Castle said, they didn't listen to him anyway. So he warned about introducing new blood. He warned about um, all of those things. And when he was there was actually a, one of the most genetically viable herds he had seen in the nation. And now it's one of the most inbred herds in the world. So um, North Dakota government wants to save them. Would government donate land to an organization like you or Frank? Those are questions we don't have answers to right now. Um, I think that right now our focus is we need to keep the horses in the park um, and then we'll take it from there. Um, I don't know how you feel Castle about like, would they ever reintroduce the Dakota horses back into the park? I don't think so. If because of the threat of disease, if nothing else, for one thing, they would say they're too genetically, you know, closely related. It's not really the same as introducing um, a completely different breed, for example, because they're only a few generations removed from the horses in the park. But also, just that's going to be a tough sell because of um, disease transmission, which is an ever increasing preoccupation of the park service for good reason you know domestic livestock are subject to a lot of diseases and health conditions that can be transmitted to wildlife and for example the you know the Kuntzes have had strangles on their place so they don't want to bring horses back that um 
infect the other horses in the park. And that makes sense too. Um, but I think it also speaks to, and I think we've said this too, if they're successful and they can remove these horses, just like they removed the Nakotas, there's no going back. Like once they've made a decision and they've moved forward, it's like the Nakotas aren't coming back. If they're successful in taking these horses out, we're not getting horses back in the park ever again. I think then that that's should... for sure. So I agree. Well, Does anybody Chris, else have any questions? Um, I hope that Castle's presentation will, can be shared. Um, I'm hoping that if technology works properly, we'll be able to share it. <laughs> um, this is a new thing for me. So I'm learning a lot of new things as I go along. So I do believe that I will be able to make a shareable copy of this. So as soon as I have that up, it'll be on our website. I guess I just want to thank everyone for coming to spend an hour of their Sunday afternoon with us to learn a little bit more about the horses. And again, Chris, I just can't say enough about how I appreciate your advocacy for the horses. It's just really inspiring. Thank you. And thank you for being here, Castle. We appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining. And we will have more of these. Um, we're working on setting them up. So um, stay tuned and keep checking our website. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great day. Great, bye. Bye.